a rather familiar piece of scripture for us. But would you believe that Philippians chapter 2 held breeding grounds for heresy in the early church? Philippians chapter 2, let me, let's do a couple of things here. Let's, let me read Philippians chapter 2, and then I'm just going to read the Nicene Creed without any background, without any backstory to it, and uh, we're going we're gonna to pick it apart, and we're going to see by the statements of the Nicene Creed, make a determination, can we, can we assess by what's said here? what was part of the problem or what was a reason for the Nicene Council, the Council of Nicaea, uh, to, to convene themselves under Constantine's authority uh, to meet to address an issue in the early church in as early as 325. So let me read Philippians chapter 2, then I'll read the, 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 the Nicene Creed, and then let's just think out loud a little bit together. Let me begin in the fifth verse. Having this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, verse 12, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not, also, uh, not as in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. So that's Philippians chapter 2. As we've noted along the way here, especially in the days when we were walking through the, the letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi, that, that a good block of that segment that's not historic narrative where Paul's saying, hey, listen, I, I want you to hold to these things, not only when I'm there, but also when I'm not there. I want you to hold to this, this truth. That this is, uh, the, the scholarly world argues that a good piece of this was an early church hymn in the days in which the apostle is writing this to the church at Philippi. He's writing to them something, if you will, of a, 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 an agreed upon statement that the early church would have either said together uh, out loud as a, a confessional statement or to a tune of some kind. We don't know the tune, but the scholarly world certainly argues that this is uh, likely a early church hymn, especially from verse 7 and, and following, where he emptied himself, taking on the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, so that those who, uh, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Well, keep, keep Philippians 2 fresh on your mind and let your eyes land on the Nicene Creed. Now, I'm going to take you to the Nicene Creed, but understand what we're, we're not comparing uh, the, the two statements. We're not comparing the Nicene Creed to Philippians chapter 2. What we're, and, and nor are we elevating the Nicene Creed to the same position that we would of Holy Scripture. 
Uh, it's in 1559 with the French Confession uh, where they make a, a gloriously beautiful argument in 1559. Let me just read what they have to say about Scripture. They, they say this about Scripture. No authority, whether of antiquity or custom or numbers or human wisdom or judgments or proclamations or edicts or decrees or councils or visions or miracles should be opposed to these holy scriptures. But on the contrary, or when they are opposed, should they be opposed to the holy scriptures? But on the contrary, all things should be examined, regulated, and reformed according to the scriptures. So what, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at church history here. Past the, cl the closing of the New Testament, past... What, what the theologians would call the canonizing of the, of the New Testament. In other words, we, we, don't have any, we don't have any other words from God to, uh, to enlighten us about who God is. But what we will have, from time to time, whenever Christendom is attacked from within with a heresy, that the church is known to do what the early church did in the book of Acts, it's recorded to us of the Jerusalem Council. And they're being faced with the growing heresy that in, if someone is going to become a Christian, there are some inside of the early, that first century church who are, who are making the argument, they, they need to be circumcised if they're going to be Christians, if they're going to be followers of God. And, and, at the, and certainly... There's another segment who's arguing if they, if, they, if, they, if they don't have to be circumcised, they at least have to abstain from eating foods like that of the Old Testament customs. Um, the Jerusalem Council made the argument no and no. They settled the issue. They gathered together. They, they, they observed the scriptures. They heard the arguments, the debates, and they came to a conclusion and what the conclusion was, they left the Jerusalem Council. This is what's recorded for us in the book of Acts. They left the Jerusalem Council to go out and correct the heresies that were beginning to begin, uh, in, especially in the outpost, the further out places of the spread of the gospel, the establishment of the church. So move us 325 years down the road. Can you imagine what kind of heresies might have showed up um, and they did and they they have and they will uh, the arguments of the need for the church to stay true to her biblical position will always be upon her now i don't mean to to put forward some information that is so elementary that you're thinking well that was a waste of my time this evening but just for the sake of dating history one to rejoice in how the world looks at the dating of history. Uh, this will help us whenever we, when we put the date 325. Modern timing, modern calculating of years, we typically call this AD 325. And so this takes you back to junior high. I mean, they used to teach this in school. Do you remember this? BC meant before Christ not before the common era. Uh, before Christ means that we, we, even though there's, not, there's no such thing as a zero year, you have the year that comes up to the year before Christ, and then you basically have a 33-year span of time that represents the life of Christ, and then you have dating that begins at 1 BC, or AD, AD 1, AD 2. So you have the the split of time, and all of the, the the impact upon Christianity is of such an enormous influence that it that the whole world begins dating, it, the the entirety of the Western world begins its dating off of the central figure of Christ. So now, where where this where where we're we're looking at this in historic Gregarian calendaring, uh, this, this doesn't take hold until about 525 uh, A.D., A.D. 525, before this, this commonness of dating things before Christ and using the Latin 
terminology, uh, Anno Domini, which meaning the, in the year of the Lord. Which, by the way, just of, just of peculiar interest. You know how presidents of the United States sign all of the documents that they sign? Whether they're a believer of Christ or not, they sign it. If it's today, it's April, what is today? 17th. April 17th, 2021. In the year, in the year of our Lord, 2022. Uh, it's pretty spectacular that, that that central figure, Christ, had that kind of an influence upon even the dating. So, so we're looking at A.D. 325. Uh, the year of the Lord, 325 years after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into glory, the, the, there is a need because of a certain doctrine that has arisen. There's a need for a conversation among the Christians. And it, or it, its origins in Scripture are right here in Philippians chapter 2. What do you do with a piece of scripture that says that Jesus denied himself the position of deity? I mean, is that what he's saying? And, 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 and if that is what he's saying, then what does that say about him? Well, it would, it would say he's mutable, he's changeable. Which, until 325... The first century church to 325, there was no question amongst the orthodox Christianity, Jesus was God. And, he, and at no point was he ever not God. So a, a, a doctrine begins to surface. So a, a little bit of church history, a little bit of world history. Um, Nicaea is a, is a community that, that does no, no longer exist by the name Nicaea, uh, but in the Roman Empire and the Byzantine empires, uh, Nicaea is a prominent uh, city. Uh, Constantinople will eventually, uh, it, it, it's known in some times, in some regions, as Constantinople. Uh, it will later be changed uh, under the, the, uh, the movement of the Ottoman Empire, so post-Rome, post-Byzantine, and then arrives the Turkish Ottoman Empire, which is largely a Muslim empire, uh, around 1378, that uh, the commerce, because of the change of commerce during the Ottoman Empire, moved things from Nicaea. Uh, the, the communities then later changed, it's, uh, and... and the, the closest community to this will be the, the community we'll know in, in modern-day Turkey as Istanbul. Uh, so Nicaea still exists under, uh, still under a, a, basically a, a, an existing a lay, layover of the Ottoman Empire, the change from Rome, the change from Byzantine, those two empires, and moved over to the Ottoman Empire, uh, renamed Iznik. Well... Uh, by the way, a mosque still exists. It was built in 1378 uh, in, there in uh, Nicaea. But at the time, this, is, this by the way, 325 is even pre in the, the inception of Islam. Islam doesn't show up until another 300 years. So there's, there's no Muslim... Uh, Nicaea is largely, radically a Christian community. Today, Christianity barely even exists in the city of Iznik, or its closest city, Istanbul. Well, it's just a little bit of, of world history for you to help put some things into place. This is a pivotal city. It's a, it's a trade city, as it would be the case in any time we, we research history of cities that have significant influence, usually there's some kind of a trade route that runs through there. Uh, it's later on in, in the, uh, isn't it interesting, we're, we're moving into modern day, whenever in around 1700, which is not all that modern, but the invention of the rail 
really is what moves the population base away from Iznik and over to um, Istanbul, which then takes it off of the trade route and moves the trade route to Istanbul. Well, it is in this time, in 325, in AD 325, that is the rise of Arianism. So you, you may say, what is Arianism? Arianism is a, is a perversion of Philippians chapter 2. Arianism uh, in, introduced, and not necessarily the originator, but certainly the one who popularizes it, and which, by the way, is usually the case of most, uh, most heresies. It's the second generation of the heresy that popularizes it. The first generation usually sits back and scratches their head and wonders, oh, I wonder if I got that right. But it's the students, it's the disciples of the heresy who really advance it and move it along. So Arianism is really a, a heresy that, that the Nicene Creed will, uh, will, will help us identify. Look at the Nicene Creed that I have in print for you. Uh, three, AD 325, uh, this is what it says. And see if you can pick out from what the Nicene Creed, which is a product of the Council of Nicaea, one of the statements that they put out. They have other things that they deal with, but this is the most popular one. See if you can pick out what the primary issue was in the early church in 325, known as Arianism. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made, who for us... Men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father and he shall Come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father, proceedeth from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and we look for the resurrection of the dead and life of the, of, the, of the world to come and the life of the world to come. Amen. So just in quick notice before we, we, we start trying to discern what is Arianism out of this creed, let me just throw out this one reminder that you as evangelical Bible-believing, God-fearing people, you know how to take your spiritual tums when you read the word Catholic. Uh, this, this does not affirm the Roman Catholic Church. That word Catholic is just the, the global church, the church that exists in that community, in that community, over that sea and across that river and in that time zone and in that language. So this is not, the, this is not an affir affirmation of the Roman Catholic Church this is just the language of what the word Catholic means. So, after reading or reminding yourself of the Nicene Creed, maybe you know your church history well enough to know, what is the primary heresy at stake for the early church in AD 325? Based off of the statement that they make. The, 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 uh, the status of Jesus is clearly the primary point here. Who is Jesus? Is he God or is he not God? Is he divine or is he not divine? What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
this is. I mean, it's laid out. It's about, by the way, this is laid out almost identical to the Apostles' Creed. If you recall from last week, we, we looked at the Apostles' Creed. There's a very similar flow to it. There's a very similar uh, layout to it. It's divided up essentially into three parts. The language about the Father, the language about the Son, the language about the Spirit. So what, what Arianism is, it's a basically arguing that the Trinity is not, is not accurate. It's, that's, that's what Arianism is making the argument, that Jesus is not equal to God. And that anyone who worships a triune God is worshiping a polygamy. A, a, a poly, they're, 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 they're polygamy. Uh, yeah, that's right. Not polygamist, but polygamy. They're, they're worshiping many gods. They're, they're worshiping God the Father, they're worshiping God the Son, and they're worshiping this other God, the Holy Spirit. And Christendom has made the argument that we're not worshiping, we're worshiping one true living God, the maker of heaven and earth, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life, who proceeded from the Father. So Arianism is making the argument that Jesus was a created being separate from the very nature of God. This was the heresy that was introduced to the early church. And so, um, ironically, as, as, as crazy and mixed up as church history is, you just got to love that God uses fallen, questionable, historic figures to bring about great, great statements like this. Now, wherever you stand on your English translations of the Bible, certainly world history will help us understand this, that the 1611 King James Version of the Bible is a blessing from the living God, that the English-speaking world gets a copy of the Word of God in their own language. You know your church history well enough to know that King James was no fearer of God. He's the one who authorizes and allows for the translation to take place. And why is that? Because there's been a long list of martyrs who were burned at the stake for trying to print the Bible in English. And King James comes along and says, you know what, enough with the bloodshed. Let me authorize a version of the Bible for the English speakers so they can have their own translation. Well, bless the Lord for King James. And bless the Lord for Constantine, who historically may, I mean, I, I'm not going to stand here today as, and question his genuine, the genuineness of his conversion, but historically we can look that there is something that happens in Constantine's life around 300, A.D. 300, A.D. 310, where he, he goes through a conversion. He's, he's a Roman Empire uh, he, he's, he's leading the Roman world. There's, they're not far off of that Byzantine trans, trans, transition. And then, you know, several, several hundred years down the road of the Ottoman transition of the empires. But God gets a hold, what it appears historically, God gets a hold of a man by the name of Constantine who's in an authoritative position. And prior to Constantine's conversion, Christians are facing enormous persecution. Constantine, who is is, we can at least historically argue, is sympathetic to the non-Aryan Christians. This is really critical because in his day, it's clear the division is wide there. You have the Aryan Christians and you have the non-Aryan Christians. The Aryan Christians are those who are saying, Jesus is not of the sub, sub, same substance of God. He's a created being. Constantine, under the supernatural kindness of God, is sympathetic to the non-Aryan Christians who are facing even more persecution than the Aryan Christians. And so Constantine is the one who orders for the council to gather and convene in Nicaea. So he gathers them together and he orders them to fix the issue. Settle this issue. Is Jesus, basically get, get together, have a meeting, may take a vote, 
and come out of there with some kind of a collaborated effort of what, what the Bible teaches us about this Jesus. Over 300 pastors and deacons gather in Nicaea. His, the history records this for us, and so we know. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we know everyone who's there, but we know um, that there is a large convening of Christians. Now, what's hard for us to know at this point, because there, there are some church history records that seems that, that the Church of Rome wants to take credit for everything that's happening here. Um, if, if Rome is at all in po- a part of this, which arguably we can, we can make the argument that they're involved at least somehow because of Constantine. But is the church under Rome authority that authorizes this as the Roman Catholic Church? This is, this is a statement that is widely accepted in church history um, by, by Catholics, by the Protestants, by the Evangelicals. This is a statement that is considered an orthodox position. So it's, it's accepted even by the Anglicans, the Episcopalians. So we, the American Anglican. And so the, 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 the Nicene Creed, as you've just read it, I would venture to say any Orthodox Christian would have, would have no problem saying, I agree with the Nicene Creed. It's the Church of Rome that will eventually come along around 700, AD 700, and they'll add one phrase to this that will will be the the dividing spot between the Eastern and the Western Orthodox. So you have your Western Orthodox, which eventually gets tagged into the group of Roman Catholicism, even though I think that's an unfair statement to put all of Christendom under the Church of Rome, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And then you have the Eastern break, which would be the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, They reject... Uh, they reject the Nicene Creed, not because of what it says, but because they didn't authorize it. It wasn't their council, uh, is their argument. And the Eastern Orthodox argue they're older than the Western Orthodox. And uh, so the Nicene Council, who gathered under Constantine, was not authorized by the Eastern Orthodox. And somewhat questionable of whether Constantine was even a bona fide believer. But really, it's not for us to... To, uh, to make that argument. It'll be by the grace of God that any of us are saved. So, not to get too lost in the weeds of church history, uh, I think that it's at least helpful to piece some world history events to the, uh, to the, to the occasion. Now, what about this Arian heresy? Uh, this is what is, is known as, the, in the 800, 8300s, is the rise of Arianism, and that Arius is from uh, the community of Alexandria, which is the city s- south. So if you're looking at a modern-day map and you have Rome, you know, Italy in the boot, Rome, the capital, and then you have um, Nicaea, which is just barely south of modern-day Istanbul, and then you would have south of the sea there is where you would have Alexandria, which is... Alexander the Great, one of, one of his implantations of, of his great empire as well. So it's Arius of Alexandria who begins teaching that Jesus was a created man and, rege- and because of that rejects the doctrine of the Trinity that has been widely accepted by the early church as a settled doctrine. Here's a few highlights of Arianism. And, and by the way, you will find that Arianism is alive and well today. Just because the Nicene Creed fixed the problem inside of Christendom, it doesn't fix the problem inside of false religions. So here's, here's the theology of Arius. Uh, he's teaching the, the uniqueness of God who alone is self-existent and immutable. And when, he's, when Arius is talking about the, the self 
existent God. He's meaning God. He's meaning God. He's not separating this out in any kind of a way of identifying Him as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's saying God is self-existent. Now at this point, you and I could be in agreement with Arius. He, he makes several arguments that the Orthodox Christian will have no problem accepting. It will get to the point, when he gets to the point of Jesus Christ, is where all the wheels fall off the bus. And so the son, when, when Arius begins to talk about the son, as, and he's not saying the son as, as in God the son, he's meaning the way that the non-Arians view Jesus as the son. That in, and Arius makes the argument that you, the, this Jesus who you call the son of God is not self-existent. He cannot be self-existent, he argues. And he argues that Jesus, uh, in order for Jesus to be a man, it exposed him as mutable. So Arius is arguing from Philippians chapter 2 that the, the text that tells us that Jesus in, was incarnated, came in the form of a man, put on the flesh of man. Arius is saying he, it, that cannot be God because that exposes God as being mutable, changeable. So it's a short-sighted, it's a, it's a poor doctrinal argument, but it's one that Arius makes, and it's one that Arius widely spreads and begins to divide the church. So he's making this argument that because Jesus, this Jesus is a man, he cannot possibly be God because he's mutable. He's, if, if so, then God, God mutated into man. Which Mutating and incarnate are two different things. Words, words really matter, don't they? Nowhere in, in the Bible do you see that God mutated into man. It's always God incarnate. Isaiah speaks of it. The New Testament shows it, exposes it, and, and preaches it. Oh, the apostles do. Um, Arius makes the argument that Jesus must be deemed a creature who is called into existence. Out of nothing, he's going to at least make an argument that Jesus is at least different than most men who are born into existence. But this Jesus who is the Christ, the Messiah, and by the way, he's not making an argument that Jesus is not, that he, that he didn't die on a cross, he didn't save man's sins. He's just arguing he's not God. So you're, you're going to begin to see, oh man, lots of world religions believe like this. And, and they do, don't they? So he's, he's making the argument that Jesus must be deemed a creature who was, not, or, or who was called into existence out of nothing and had a beginning. I, let me just take you... I mean, the problem sits in the way one believes and the way one is reading something. So just, just for the sake of helping, helping us at least be kind-hearted toward Arius, not sympathetic, but... Because Arius is, is an appointed pastor in Alexandria, an appointed bishop uh, to preach the Bible, to teach the Bible to the people. And he's, he's reading through Philippians in his own language, in his own translation of the Bible, in his language, and he's reading this from Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to include verses 3 and following. Do nothing from selfish or empty deceit, but, in, but with humility... Of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. Having this mind, having this attitude, this is where many of the historic scholars believe the, the hymn begins. Having this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as a thing to be grasped. So Arius is making the argument that even Jesus didn't see himself as deity. Now, you know you're going to have to throw many of the things that Jesus said in the Gospels out if Jesus isn't going to make claim to being deity. Because we see he does, and he is. And the scriptures of old teach us that these prophecies are about him. So Arius is making the argument that Jesus was a created creature and came into existence. 
so in other words, he's not a self-existent being like God. Arius further then would make the argument that the Son can have no direct knowledge of the Father. So he, Arius is making the argument Jesus didn't even know he was going to be the Savior, that he was going to be used of God for this, because if he could not even know that, because he's not self-existent. He doesn't have... There, so man, you sit back and, and wonder how hard it must be and how hard it must have been for, for people to begin to accept a triune, the language of, tr of the Trinity, uh, that Jesus is, uh, is not a created creature who's, who's created out of nothing and has a beginning. So Arius makes the argument, as the Arians, uh, anyone who follows him would continue to make the argument that the Son can have no direct knowledge of the Father and, of a, and, and he's of a total different order. Because, he's not, because he can't be self-existent, he's not self-existent, but he's different than other flesh because this Jesus is created out of nothing. Which at least puts him in, a, in an ele which the Philippian argument is, that he's elevated to the position where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. But prior to that, he wasn't even an existent being, according to Arius. So those worshiping Jesus, Arius makes the, the, the greater push that those who worship Jesus are polytheist, which is an affront to the worshipers of God who, who are facing persecution by Rome for not bending the knee to Rome because they will call no one Lord but Jesus. No one gets the position of Lord of my life but Jesus. And so Arius makes these arguments. Constantine, by the grace of God, sympathetic to the non-Arians, orders for the bishops, orders for the pastors to convene in the city of Nicaea, and he orders them, settle the issue, get it right, figure it out, and come out with a statement for us. Now, some historians will say that Constantine said, find a way to make Jesus equal with God. But we can't find any place in, in history that Constantine makes that claim or makes that order to the, to the council. But historians who want to poke at the Nicene Council are saying there's, there's a, a devious movement behind it to create the Trinity to make Jesus part of the Trinity, to, make, to introduce the language, the word Trinity. Um, but we don't, we, don't, we don't have any legitimate argument that Constantine was ordering them to settle this and, and, uh, and, and, and debunk everything that Arius is arguing for. So Constantine's sympathy toward the non-Arians is what brings this about. Now, Arianism is declared from the Nicene Creed, uh, Arius himself is declared a heretic. He's, he's, uh, a statement is made about him. He is disenfranchised from the church. He's removed from the position of pastor of his church in Alexandria. He's exiled, if you will, from the church. And by the church, I'm not meaning the Roman Catholic Church. I'm meaning... The, 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 the early days of the church had this glorious understanding that this church and that church and this church and that church were all part of the church, the, the Catholic, the universal, the church from everywhere. But the council gathered to do much like, and they took this, the samples, they took the, the example we have of the book of Acts that we're going to have a council, we're going to invite the pastors from the region, and we're going to settle the issue on Jesus so the Nicene Council convenes primarily. They do have a couple of other things that they talk about and argue for, but none of them really come out of the council. But the, the, what we call the Nicene Creed. Um, so the council declares Arius a heretic, uh, excommunicates him, if you will. He's disenfranchised. Historians tell us that there is an attempt about 20 years down the road from this to, uh, 
to persuade Arius out of his heresy. And there's a, at least a folklore of some kind that argues that uh, Arius saw the error of his ways and was on his way to sign a document uh, to denounce his heresy. And he, he died before he could get to, um, to sign the document. So we don't really know if, if, he, if he... Folklore says that about him. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to behave kindly toward him, even though he introduced great harm, enormous harm to the souls of men. Arianism did not die whenever the church excommunicated Arius. It still exists in strong form today in the Jehovah Witness denomination, cult. It still exists in Mormonism. Jesus, Jesus' nature is altogether different than God the Father. He's, he's not... I mean, the, the Mormons will make the argument that Jesus is God, but they cannot make the argument that He was God. So, which is essentially Arianism in a modern form. Jehovah Witness, who, 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 who will denounce to their dying days if they're going to be true to their cultic belief and understanding that Jesus cannot be God. It's not even possible. He was not even going to become a God. He wasn't a God. He was a man and He will never be a God. Certainly, they, they want to put Him in the position of a great teacher, a great man. You know how absurd that kind of thinking is. So, just because Arius is, is shown as a heretic, and out of that Nicene Council comes a statement about the Trinity, and that the church universally is widely accepted as a, 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 a helpful argument. I want to I read it again, and uh, then just make a few closing comments concerning the doctrine of the Trinity and how critical it is in our day. This is back to the document of the Nicene Creed, the Council of Nicaea, 325, properly dated A.D. 325, in the year of our Lord, 325. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God. Now, this is it's talking about Jesus here. God of God, light of light, very God of very God. It's R.C. Sproul that says, I like, to, I like to say it as truly God and truly, of, of truly God. Very God of very God. Begotten. Notice, notice, how, notice the clarity they want to give to the heresy of Arianism. Not made. They're saying Jesus is of the same nature as God the Father. Not made. Being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. Who, was, or who, for, us, who, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. So you mean, the language of Philippians chapter 2 is obviously the course of study at the Nicene Council. Came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and on the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. That's everything they're saying about the second person of the Trinity who is of the same nature of the Father. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeded from the Father. It's, it's a... It, it, it's, uh, it's Rome who, who adds, it's the Church of Rome who adds a, a parenthetical phrase here. Or I will call it a parenthetical. If you're reading this from a Roman Catholic document, that line two of the third paragraph, who proceeded from the Father, it would, it would add this, and the Son. 
to one to one degree I say I don't I don't know that there's much to be much to have much heartburn over them adding the sun, but that doesn't come for another 600 years after the Nicene Creed is uh, is released. Um, but that's one of the things that will divide that will severely divide the church, the Eastern and the Western church, is whenever Rome uh, adds and the sun. Uh, well, anyway. Uh, proceeded from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke of the prophets. And we believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The doctrine of the Trinity was under severe attack as early as 300 in the year of our Lord. It was in July of 325 when over 300 pastors and bishops, pa pastors, elders, bishops, deacons gathered in the city of Nicaea. And that to deal with the doctrine that you and I largely take for granted. And it came, it came with a severe, uh, it came in a severe time of the life of the church. His, history tells us that had the church not convened in Nicaea, I'll make the argument, the church will always survive. If, the, if not in Nicaea, the Lord would have provided another place to clarify the issue. But whenever we're looking back in history, had not the Nicene Council convened, the truth of what the scripture teaches, we don't know when it would have resurfaced again. We know that there are times when we look at the dark days, the dark ages as they're called, where, where many of the true doctrines of the Bible are hidden from men. And they're hidden from men on purpose so that the church, and here I'm meaning the Roman church, can manipulate people for their money. And they do it with the fear of hell for them and their loved ones. And they do it, and they become filthy rich in the course of it. But it is, it is a kindness of God that God would use what would eventually become the Roman Catholic Church, that He would use the counsel of a, a very new convert who's sympathetic toward the truth and orders for the council to gather and to come, come out of this thing with an answer. And the position is either support Arius or declare Arius a heretic. Can you imagine? You're the center point of the council of Nicaea. The, 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 the heresies that you're, in, that you're propagating, that you're advancing. The council was so convinced to settle this issue on the nature of Christ that we have... We have, the, we, we have the historically, not biblically, we have historically the best document preserved for us that came as a result of people who studied the Word of God and argued Jesus is divinity. He is truly God and truly man. He is not one or the other. He is indeed, well, Arius got this right, Jesus was a uniquely different person than all of us. Isaiah makes the argument that he is altogether different. Meaning there's nothing even similar to him because he's self-existent and he's existed throughout all of eternity this way and that way. Every, as far back as you can go B.C. and as far forward as you can go A.D. Jesus was and is God. For the glory of God we bless the Lord for the Nicene Council. Now, of somewhat interest, because today is Easter, I found this of interest this week while I was researching some of the Nicene Creed, or the Nicene, Nicaea Council, is that they were also instructed to settle when Easter is. Uh, I found that extraordinarily interesting. Uh, I don't know if you know this, the Eastern Orthodox, they, they have a different Easter. Uh, than you. And it's usually a couple of weeks later than us. 
Uh, there's a Eastern Orthodox Church here in Twin Falls, and uh, I know the, the the gentleman who leads the group. And every time we talk about Easter, he says, "Well, yeah, I'm not so busy that week <laughs> because I'm busy in a couple of weeks <laughs> with with Easter." But they, the Nicene Council was in, was instructed by Constantine to settle the issue of Easter, because you know Easter flies all over the calendar, and we're early in the Gregorian calendar days. Uh, really the inception of them is just beginning to happen and what do we do about this count this event in world history that floats all over the place from March April um, can, can we just put a date on the calendar and call that Easter I will say bless the Lord the Nicaea Council came out of that and said we're not going to do that <laughs> but did you know in 1963 the the the, uh, the most popular of the of the Roman Catholic councils Vatican II, um, I forget who the Pope was in 1960. Pope, was it Pope Paul? He wanted to fix Easter on the, the first or the second Sunday of April. He says, we can do that. We ought to do that. I say, bless the Lord. The Christian community rises up and says, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to observe Easter on the day in which it happens. Now, the reason why the Eastern Orthodox and the Western Church, the Eastern and the Western Church looks at Easter at a different spot is because one is working off of a Gregorian calendar and one's working off a Julian calendar. And so that's why uh, you have the discrepancy. Sometimes they, they land on the same weekend, but pretty rarely. And that was just of an interest I found this week. Uh, bless the Lord, the Nicaea Council did not fix the date of Easter. Christ fixed the date of Easter. When he died on the cross. Well, bless the Lord. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's helpful for us to know wh how these events get talked about and argued out in church history. And uh, I think, bless the Lord for Philippians chapter 2 that's helpful. But notice how easy it would be to fall into a heresy if you don't read Scripture the way the Scripture's teaching us truth as. Scripture is not teaching us that Jesus was not God. Scripture clearly is, and so bless the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time tonight, and we thank you. This day, certainly, whether it's a fixed day on a calendar or, or a day that floats as it ought to, we say bless you, the living God. We can say tonight, while we're on this and Easter occasion, reminded of the death and the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would also be talking about in church history when the Council of Nicaea convened to settle the issue of Arianism. So God, we pray for our neighbors and our friends who still believe Arian doctrines, and that you would liberate them from the bondage of this, putting their hope in wrong places and upon wrong figures. Lord, may, through your kindness, may they see and taste Jesus as the living God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Well, happy Resurrection Day to you. It's good to put an exclamation point to the day, isn't it? <laughs>